So, today's spotlight uh, is a conversation with Tony Abbott, a professor of uh, environmental science and studies. Uh, and I have a couple of questions that I would like to ask Tony as we begin. Um, I would like to say that this is an experiment. Uh, this is a, just going to be a conversation that I'm confident will evolve organically. And um, it will be able to, you'll be able to um, listen to this conversation uh, at a future date on the uh, Brown Center's YouTube channel. So to begin, thank you for uh, agreeing to do this, Tony. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it. So, Tony, how long have you been a faculty member at Stetson? I've been here, it's my 17th year, but the way they do things, they just gave me my 15 year pin last year uh, for some reason, but I started here in 2005 in August. And the environmental science program uh, was a program, not a department at that time. And I was brought in as the director and there was only one other faculty member in my department at the time uh, who retired and left me kind of by myself in the department. So that, that seemed Bradford, like the, right? yeah, that was Bruce Bradford. Uh, he's in uh, Montana now and doing fine, teaching still. Oh, really? uh, yeah, so uh, when, when the department went through that uh, compression, uh, that seemed like a good time to sort of rethink things and, and move in the direction of environmental science department in, with environmental studies. And uh, we had a, a great period of growth there. And now the department has uh, six or five tenure and tenure track members. Well, I think we're at six now, uh, just this year. And then some support faculty and the number of majors since then has grown from 12 when I started to uh, 100 uh, now. Oh, so really, you have 100 majors now. Wow, that's yeah, great. so uh, I'm real proud of, of the, the place that, that I've managed to find myself in here. And uh, I really enjoy my colleagues and the work we do. And I think the university uh, uh, wants to embrace what it is uh, we're, we're prioritizing in, in our department. So yeah, uh, been a good you know decade and a half. It's interesting you <clears throat> mentioned this because that was one of the questions I was going to ask you, if you would mind providing a brief history of the evolution of the department, because We've worked together for almost two decades, uh, you, you know, and I um, remember fondly working with Bruce. Uh, he was actually a neighbor of ours. When we right, you guys lived next West. door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was our neighbor. Um, but yeah, the, the department has really grown, and you were, as they would say in biology, right, a pioneer. <laughs> Yeah, a K species, I believe. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, how did you um, come become interested in your area of work, Tony? Well, that, um, that goes all the way back to before I was in college, actually. Uh, and I had kind of a circuitous path to uh, the major I finally found. Uh, I knew I was interested in uh, the environmental issues, right? And, and not unusual for... Uh, someone of my upbringing at that time to think that these were the pressing issues of the day. Uh, and uh, of course, my thinking's changed over time, but it's through Greenpeace literature that I became aware of these things. And I went to Georgia Tech to become an environmental engineer thinking, you know, that that's the way forward because I had an interest in science fiction uh, and the environment. And so engineering was always how problems were solved in science fiction of that era. So, you know, if you're a scientist, you go and fix things by being an engineer. Uh, when I got into environmental engineering at Georgia Tech in the mid 80s, uh, I quickly discovered that that had a lot to do with pouring concrete and treating sewage sludge. And it was sort of on the wrong end of the pipe for me, right? You know. I was more interested in kind of like, you know, rather than dealing with the problems, I'm interested in finding solutions that avert those problems altogether. So I left college for quite a while and, you know, just knocked around for a while around Atlanta until I started to read a bit more about different 
you know, ways of approaching the university. And that's when I discovered geography. And once I started understanding what geographers do, that was it for me. I was off to the University of Georgia and boom, uh, just I couldn't be stopped. And I liked what I was doing in college so much that I never left, I guess is the, the story that I like to tell students. So the path to where I am today kind of goes through, you know, the hard sciences. So it started with, you know, forest policy, uh, no, I'm sorry, forest conservation, and then uh, energy conservation. And then finally, I got into agrobiodiversity for my PhD at the University of Minnesota. And the University of Minnesota was an unusual school because it was at the cutting edge of what we call the cultural turn in geography. And this is a, a point in which we stop thinking about the environment as this thing, you know, a subject of, of study, but actually a, a process of being, uh, you know, in society, right? So uh, we started unpacking terms like nature, right, and conservation and, uh, you know, resource and realizing that all of those really had to do with things about our own culture and less about what we were studying outside of us. So uh, that's how I came to be more of a social scientist than a scientist uh, through my uh, career. And uh, as I've been here uh, at Stetson, sort of just jump over about 10 years of PhD research in my first position in, in Washington State. Uh, when I got here, I was tasked with looking at uh, the carbon emissions of campus, the greenhouse gas. I remember, gas that. I remember that, right. Yeah, that, right. Yeah, it's one of those things when you're a young professor, somebody who's much higher in administration says, it would be a really good idea if someone does this. And we think that person is you. And so I took it on. carbon audit, right? If I remember yeah, correctly. yeah, our greenhouse gas audit, our yeah, carbon audit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I've been working with students on that since 2006. Uh, so that started really early. And we, we're doing every other year. And now we do them every year. And in the process of that, I've sort of built this group of students called the Environmental Fellows. And uh, they're students that I mentor in a pseudo class environment, but we meet every semester. So I actually mentor them throughout their entire four years. Uh, I, I don't know of any other thing like this on campus, frankly, where students have to sit in front of the same faculty member once a week through their entire time at Stetson. And so that's the type of thing to do. And I, and I guide them and, and try and use them to help foster a more environmentally progressive, you know, campus, right? So uh, that was one of the, the big areas in which, you know, my student teaching scholarship uh, uh, nexus kind of all came together, right? So, so my research has kind of rotated a bit around that work since I've gotten here. Uh, so, uh, coming forward to, to where I'm at now, uh, that work has always still been kind of, you know, well, let's just look at this scientifically, we'll count the carbon and we'll see if we can bring it down. Uh, but that's not really dealing with the issues of inequity, which I kind of have come to realize underlies pretty much all major problems that we're having uh, nowadays. And uh, they're very clear ways that it ties in with the environmental movement. Uh, but I've, I've tried to, to decenter my work with the environment and move that more towards a focus on inequity and use the environment as an entry to bring people who kind of started or starting where I started in the 80s in terms of saying the environment is everything and that's how we're going to save the world and saying actually there are kind of deeper issues that tie into this and I'm trying to shepherd people into, you know, thinking about those conversations uh, by using the environment as the, as the gateway, mm -hmm. so to speak. And that's wow. where the Barkham Project is. Okay. Okay. So if you were to, um, you still consider yourself a geographer? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's, it's where it's at. Right. So, right? so if, you were to, if you were to describe geography today, to a layperson in the fewest number of words possible, what would those words be? Four words. Just a it's fewest the, number. I'm sorry, five words. Okay. It's the why of where. 
please elaborate. Yeah, so it's the why of where. So geography is a discipline which is based on spatial relationships. So to put it simply and, and to, you know, really gloss what history is, uh, history is, you know, the analysis of things through time. Uh, but there are a lot of methods and, you know, sort of ways of asking questions and unearthing evidence that sort of underlie that, you know, looking at things through time, right? Geography is looking at things in space, right? So why here and not there? And why better here than there? And so we look at, you know, like history, any number of topics. So we can look at geology, we can look at economics, we can look at identity, right? So, I mean, we've got the natural, physical, and uh, humanities all, I'm sorry, the physical, the social, and the humanities all in, in, the, in the mix there. And then we can even get creative and try and find the intersections amongst those. And so I'm interested in finding the intersections between the physical and the social sciences. That's really where I've lived so much. I'm just now kind of getting into the humanities with the public history uh, work that I'm doing now. And uh, apparently this is all the rage in, in history. Uh, and I didn't even realize it. I just kind of stumbled into it. Uh, and uh, that's, that's why I like geography, because it, it allows me to do all these different things. And uh, uh, people say that's the same in environmental science, but the environmental science is a little more topically focused, like a lot of disciplines are. So, you know, biology, the study of life, uh, political science, the, the study of, you know, politics and, you know, the management of people through policy, right? Uh, geography, history, these philosophy, these are the types of disciplines where the subject matter really is anything in the world. Uh, and what drives the, the analysis is really the way things are related uh, to one another. So that's why geography. It's interesting how our uh, professional and you know uh, scholarly paths evolve, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I, I never anticipated being where I'm at philosophically now, uh, and and dealing with uh, you know the things uh, that I'm dealing with. Uh, the work I do with now uh, is. Uh, it turns out to be much more personal than, than where I thought research would go. When you're studying the environment and it's out there, you're trying to save this thing, right? And uh, like, so I have this very, I begin with this very paternal position, you know, uh, one might even say patriarchal position where like the environment out there is in crisis. I need to do things to fix it, right? Uh, and, you know, fully recognizing that, you know, we have done things to cause the problems, but it's on me to fix it. And it's just a very weird kind of, you know, way to kind of structure how we should intervene in the world, right? And the work I do now, uh, rather than seeing myself trying to solve problems in the world, I, as often as anything, end up looking at myself and saying, what do I need to fix about myself here to, to make this problem, uh, you know, not so serious or to, you know, try and diffuse it and make it, you know, something that doesn't get perpetuated uh, uh, at all, right? And that's why my research has become much more social science oriented and, you know, in a way, uh, humanities where I'm just trying to be creative in, in, that, in that journey. I appreciate you mentioning that um, because you can help us understand better um, and, and appreciate, you know, what it is that you do and what are some of the drivers, you know, that, that motivate you to take on your work. Uh, so often I think that we understand as educators, right, as scholarly individuals, what we do and the importance of what we do to ourselves, but others that reside outside of our bubble, if you will, to use a term that, um, you know, is another person's term, but I'll use bubble today. Uh, I think it's important for us to try to help people understand or have a little more clarity about, you know, why would you pursue this work. Now, why is it important not only to you, but to, uh, to others? So I really do appreciate 
um, you sharing a little bit of, of those thoughts. Uh, put on a, put another way, um, where does it fall on the spectrum of your research and scholarly endeavors? Because I know you know you have a career now, right? Yeah. You've been doing this for a career uh, for more than a decade. Um, so is this something that you're going you're to talk about today? Is this work something new, or does it represent the advancement or you know an evolution of your understanding? of your area of interest? It's definitely a journey uh, of evolution. And uh, Thank you as I said, this. it's kind of personal. So uh, I, I'll i share a bit here. And, you know, I've done this in conversation and I'm a, a little trepid to put this online, but I think I thought about it enough where I think I know how to talk about this without getting myself into trouble and uh, without coming off in a way that I, I don't want to come off like. So I grew up in the South, right? And uh, I was born in the 60s. So there's a lot of baggage with my childhood uh, that, you know, this kind of comes with growing up uh, in uh, uh, middle class, you know, predominantly white society, uh, you know, with patriarchal kind of men have working roles and women are at home. Uh, kind of attitudes, right? And this is kind of baggaged up with the work I'm doing. So I want to just jump way far away from that in, in history now to what I'm doing now so that maybe those connections become clear. I just want to put that over there for context for thinking about, you know, how this is work on myself as well as work that I'm doing. Um, another part of the journey is, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. I publish many papers, I've done the scholarly literature, I do peer review quite often for, for journals, and uh, I, I mentor other students into, you know, their, their tenure track and, and success there. And uh, for all the research that, that I've produced and put out there, uh, I think maybe a few dozen people have reached out to me to discuss my work with me, right, and, you know, to want to get a deeper understanding of it. And so we're talking at, you know, about one person a year for, for all the time I put into that. And that's uh, not as high a return as I would like to see for the, the effort I'm putting in, because I feel like the things that I'm discovering are, are worth discussing and, and worth getting out there. Uh, but this is the nature of, of scholarly literature, right? They go into these, these journals, which are pretty rarefied, and you have to have access to, you know, pretty expensive databases to get access to these journals in the first place. So to read my work, you either have to be in a university or, you know, be willing to pay a lot of money to see it. Uh, and I think I would like more people to see this work. So my work has moved more into the public history realm. And what I'm doing is trying to take the insights I have from social sciences and get them into more lay literature. And uh, part of this has been through my project with William Barker, uh, for which I received a summer grant funding last summer, which is, I believe, why I'm here speaking at a factory spotlight. So uh, it's worth, you know, talking about that, that work. So William Bartram is recognized as a touchstone uh, naturalist in the South. He existed in colonial and revolutionary America. Uh, his life is kind of, you know, bisected by the Revolutionary War. And uh, he was one of the first people to go out and in, you know, the tradition of the romantics, like Wordsworth and Longfellow, to go out and describe American landscapes. When I came to know Bartram in uh, my first undergraduate program uh, at University of Georgia, uh, I learned of him as a Southern naturalist. And, you know, reading his books, his book, um, Travels of William Bartram, um, you can't help but know that he's listing a lot of different plants and, and things like that. And people would talk about him as this person who was discussing the Southern landscape. And uh, even more interestingly, as you start traveling around, you know, hiking or going to gardens and things like this uh, throughout the South, and we're talking all the way from Louisiana to North Carolina down to Florida, uh, even in, yeah, these areas and everything in between. 
uh, you'll see him mentioned in historical markers about how he traveled through, you know, like a pristine southern landscape. And, uh, you know, he described this plant for the first time, right? And it, and it builds up this, you know, sort of historical narrative of this man in a wild place describing new creatures that were not known to, to humans at all, right? Uh, and hopefully, you know, people are, you know, uh, enlightened enough with the, the rhetoric and the discourse now to know that, you know, of course, that's not what Bartram was seeing. Of course, Bartram was in a landscape that, that had a very long history of human occupation and that there were already alien and invasive plants coming into this area, as well as, you know, new cultures, uh, which we could definitely call uh, invasive and alien uh, at the same time. So Bartram wasn't actually going through a landscape that was uh, pristine, so to speak. But a lot of the history and a lot of the representation of Bartram going through this landscape is, is of that nature, right? And these are especially uh, memorialized on those big, you know, brass plaques, the historical markers. You'll see that uh, all over the place. So as I was beginning to look at Bartram uh, here for a project, I was casting about for something, you know, new to do uh, besides the carbon audits. And I finished up some other work. I said, I'd like to go back to this. And I started reading it. And I almost immediately began to realize, whoa, I haven't read this guy for a long time. And his story that he's telling is not like the narrative, which I'm just now describing to you. Most of his book is about Native Americans and, and the places they're inhabiting. He's always talking about people in the landscape, right? And then as I start digging into, you know, the papers, Tom Halleck at University uh, uh, South Florida, St. Pete. Um, uh, he has a, a really lovely volume uh, that gathers all of Bartram's letters together. Uh, and as you start, you know, looking at these letters and everything, you start, I start realizing he's actually in a, a, a very complex milieu, right, that has to do with colonials and Native Americans, but also African Americans who are helping build a nation at that time, right? And so, the historical context of Bartram, as you really dig into his work and the work that sort of surrounds his life, paints a very different picture from these historical markers. And so one of the first studies I did with, Bart, did with Bartram was just to, you know, take all the historical markers, analyze the text and unpack what the story that's being told there. So rather than, you know, saying, oh, there's a marker and that's the story, read them all as if they're one text and see what the emergent story is using digital humanities. So I enter it all in the spreadsheet and I start coding for certain types of ways that uh, Bartram is being spoken about. And we start looking for trends. And oh, wow. this, yeah. And so the trend is very much in the historical markers, you know, in nearly half the instances uh, of language that kind of evokes uh, an unpeopled and wild America, right? Which, we know isn't the case. You know, we're we're not that far off from getting into a very active project of relocating Native Americans to Oklahoma, right? They they were there and they were a problem for Americans right? <laughs> at, this, at this point. And I use this in quotes because you know, uh, you know, the term American is actually multifaceted, but the way it was being possessed at that time was, you know, to move. Uh, Cherokee and Creek people off the land that was, you know, pertaining to America uh, at that time. So, uh, uh, a, a, this is how far, how long after, say, Andrew Jackson? Or oh, he's prior to this. He would right, be a bit prior. prior. This, but yeah. So, because you know, Jackson is in, in the 19th century, uh, uh, and uh, he's occurring in. So he hits Florida for the first time in 1765, and then again in 1774. Right, so this is the time that, that Bartram's traveling in, in our part of the world, which is where I'm focused. Uh, yeah. So uh, when you start digging into to this this story, uh, Bartram's in a in a very complex milieu. Uh, his family is actually buying and selling people to fund their ventures. Right. So we're not getting the story of Bartram as a slave trader. Right. We're getting Bartram as the guy who describes butterflies in this unproblematic landscape. And for me, that's that's, you know, perpetuating 
one of the main problems that environmentalists describe now, right? Where we describe the environment is this thing out there and society is this thing over here. And when we're talking about the environment, we don't have to talk about inequality for, for economic or race or you know, gender or any of these types of things which are now getting kind of bound up in this you know, literature of identity and intersectionality, right? Somehow the environment is supposed to stay apart from that. And it is compelling to people who are concerned about their place the place of their culture in the world moving forward, right? And I'm, I'm sure you're aware, Harry, that we're involved in some pretty problematic culture wars right now, right? And, and this type of understanding of the environment and the ability to go and think about places that are, you know, devoid of this history is a safe space for people who don't want to engage with these thorny questions, right? And so when we talk about America's national parks as the America's uh, best idea, Native Americans probably have a different view <laughs> of that, right? You know, when we we're talking about um, Yosemite, one of the first orders of business was to clear Native Americans out of that to create the national parks, which are places that are supposedly uninfluenced by, you know, the works of humans, right? And at the time, and you know, the works of man, which meant men, not women, white men, not, you know, so uh, very uh, interesting types of social dynamics that are kind of made invisible uh, through this process. So it's those types of dynamics that, that, that I was seeing with Bartram as I was getting involved in this relatively benign project of saying, oh, I'm just going to, you know, make a digital map, you know, like the historical markers to tell the stories of Bartram online so you don't have to drive there and see them there. And then I start seeing, you know, you know, things that are you know, just much, you know, troubling to me, frankly. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's uh, how the work has evolved, right? Wow. And you know, in the last few years, we've had, you know, uh, uh, all of these tragic murders, you know, move to a proper, you know, to greater recognition uh, in. In, in popular culture, right? You know, and I'm speaking uh, specifically of the murders of, of black men and black women uh, that are, you know, uh, perpetrated in the name of justice or, uh, you know, vigilanteism, right? Which has led to the, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement really growing uh, and I think creating a, a, a better consciousness uh, uh, across the nation, I would hope, right? That's, that's, that's my feeling. And uh, I feel like, uh, that movement provides the opportunity to start rethinking the way we represent these landscapes in a way that uh, embraces diversity, equity, and inclusion in a way that it hasn't really been so in the past. And so uh, that's kind of a long answer to the evolution of my work. Uh, in, in a, let me bring it back to the beginning, right? You know, uh, I grew up in a time when. Uh, I was expected to behave and say things which I just think are wrong now, right? And, you know, I carry shame for things that I did when I was younger, right? And not for any ill intent, but because I was trying to be part of a community. Unfortunately, that community was a perversion of what I think a good community should be. And so this project is helping me work through some of, you know, the things that I take from my childhood as, as memories that might have been cherished of friends, but I have to realize now that, you know, those weren't good memories that I was creating for others. So uh, it, you know, it invites this, this introspection. And, and I hope by going through this process in front of students uh, and including students in the process and sharing, you know, kind of the, the fullness of why I do this with them, that it enables them to think of their work in, in, uh, in ways like this, which, uh, you know, I just think it's important. I um, truly appreciate you sharing that. Seriously, uh, because what you described was a historic view through one lens, right? And th this is my novice, um, through one lens and 
you have through very significant level of intentionality broadened the scope, right? Broaden the the level of investigation under, to understand um, your, this, the, the focus of your work, the, right? The, the principal character of your work. And there is a lot of, like you said, personal and cultural history behind that. And that, that was really powerful. Um, I would never, I would never have that to this level had I not had an opportunity to have this discussion with you today. So thank That's, you. It's hard stuff to get into a four page grant proposal and, uh, and in the brief reports that come afterwards, right? Uh, I think it happens at the meta level, but I do try and talk with people in the community about it in this way when I'm, I'm reaching out to do it. Uh, yeah. So, and, Go on, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So as you did this work, or as you continue to do this work um, over and over the, in the presence of, uh, you know, in spite of the pandemic, uh, what were some of the things that you had to do differently uh, to continue this work? Or were you fortunate to be one of the few that were spared some of the logistical nightmares of a pandemic? Yeah, so some aspects were, were, you know, not affected and actually encouraged uh, by the pandemic and other aspects were uh, discouraged. Uh, but I think the, the parts that were discouraged were a temporary setback. So one of my hats at Stetson is to teach geographic information systems. Uh, at the introductory level. So to get our uh, environmental science students into making maps uh, on computers. Uh, without getting too technical with it, uh, we had a, a model of teaching GIS prior to the pandemic, which prioritized static map making, right? And geographical analysis that was very much in the sort of scientific uh, uh, reductionist worldview, right? Where you get information and you try and deduce things by bringing data and spreadsheets into it, right? And there is an aspect of artistry to it, but not very dynamic. Uh, as a result of the pandemic, I could not teach GIS in that way any, anymore because uh, the software we were using uh, required students to be in a lab. It's not something they can put on their own computer and take home. Uh, you know, uh, unless we were willing to give every student a fairly powerful computer and we, we could not do that. We had other priorities with our money at the time, right? You know, making spaces sanitary and safe. So uh, I had to stop that course in midstream, which uh, was a good course, <laughs> I will say, and uh, basically start over um, and learn GIS anew in an entirely different way. Uh, and I had to learn GIS so that I could teach and grade students' work completely online. What that did was it pushed me into learning how to do interactive web mapping. Uh, and it pushed me into ways of teaching students cartography, which are much more aligned with the media delivery platforms that we're using now, right? So... Students now are um, learning in my class not how to do uh, maps that they have a hard time seeing their functionality in the world until maybe they're in the career for two or three years and they go, oh yeah, I remember seeing this stuff. They can now start making maps that they can share with people at the end of class, that they can share with people in their job portfolios that are on live and interactive, that they can just shoot a link to someone to. Uh, and uh, I, I got to tell you, they're very excited about being able to, to do these types of things. So uh, because of the pandemic, I was able to shift into a more contemporary way of map making. And uh, I think this is going to serve me and the students for 
uh, a long time to come. The technology is always changing. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, can I as a teacher change uh, along with it at uh, an adequate pace? And the pandemic gave me the kick to do what uh, I had been uh, thinking about doing for a while and I might have put off for another year. Um, but I'm in a great place with that now. So the way that relates to this project is now, uh, instead of you know, making the types of maps that I had made before, uh, and uh, so for example, the, the, the main uh, piece of production, I've done some scholarship about Bartram that's come out that I've shared at conferences, uh, but uh, the main piece of you know, uh, media that's come out related to my Bartram work is uh, a, a map you know, when you go to a rest area and they have all of the tourist information up there and you can just- There's always a map on the wall. Yeah, there's yeah. always a map on the wall. Right? Yeah, so there's a map on the wall, but they also have the brochures of the different things you can do, the tourist of activities. So we made a brochure that's a map that opens up that's related to the Bartram stuff, right? Cool. And so that's, you know, distributed at all the rest areas as you come into Florida. And in some of the you know hotels and areas around the area in Central Florida here, so thirty thousand copies of that brochure will eventually find their way into the hands of people, uh, and I would like to think that maybe half of them will even open them and and have a look uh, cool. at them. So fifteen thousand people will be getting you know uh, a little bit of of information from that, right? I feel like with the digital, uh, we can hit fifteen thousand people in. Uh, uh, in a year uh, very easily. And uh, there is no limit to how many people can see it. If it if it catches on, it could, you know, who knows, right? I doubt it will become viral, but you know, I do think it will have a wider distribution and definitely a wider potential for distribution. And unlike a paper map, which once you print it, that's it. Uh, a digital map can be tweaked, right? So if we start finding uh, new interesting information, we can drop it in. Right. If something becomes obsolete, we can take it out uh, and uh, we can also link it with, you know, other, you know, collaborators uh, in this regard. So uh, uh, the Bartram work uh, started with the River of Lakes Heritage Quarter locally here in Volusia, Seminole Lake and uh, Putnam counties in Flagler. Uh, and now, uh, as a result of my work, uh, I very quickly ended up creating affiliations with a Florida chapter uh, that works on Bartram. And now the national Bartram chapter is asking me to produce maps for them uh, that I'm gonna be you know, providing in January, uh, which spins out of this work. It moves along parallel with the summer grant, uh, uh, but I'm gonna be providing prototype maps for them so they can make the case for the National Park Service to you know, kind of promote the Bartram Trail uh, and, you know, while I'm in the process of doing that, I'm going to be saying, by the way, the story isn't this, the story is this. And so um, uh, that's, you know, because of the, the digital media, some of the opportunities that come out, uh, come about as a result of the pandemic. The things that have hindered me a little bit is that I've been wanting to get out and meet some people in the community who I have not, you know, made the effort to get out and meet with regards to the type of work I'm doing now. So along with the Bartram, I'm on the River of Lakes Heritage Corridor Board and was much more active with it uh, before the pandemic. Uh, but uh, as part of that work and as part of some work with the St. John's River to Sea uh, Loop Alliance, which uh, works with bicycle trails, uh, we started getting involved in a project uh, with lost histories. And so uh, one of the things that we'd like to start doing as a result of this is rather than focusing on Bartram, uh, I would like to start getting students involved in unearthing uh, African-American black histories uh, in this region to start tying it to the media, which is promoting outdoor recreation. So we have a really nice bicycling infrastructure around Volusia County, uh, but its outreach I think is kind of limited because it invites I mean, it wants to be inclusive, but there's just something about outdoor recreation, which is sort of slants middle class, slants, you know, white uh, for the most part. And so the idea is to create uh, histories associated with these landscapes that, uh, you know, highlight diversity of our history here, right? So there are a lot of stories. Uh, 
uh, about uh, the African American or the black role of you know developing Volusia County, and I'm sure these stories span across Florida, right? So, in association with Bartram, is bringing these histories out so they can be brought into this same uh, type of platform. And I already have students working on this uh, with Volusia Remembers. Uh, it's a group that uh, is. Uh, I'm familiar with Volusia Remembers, absolutely. Yeah, so they're re memorializing racial violence in in the community. And one of my students has built a, a fairly large story map uh, about that in Volusia County. And I'm very proud to you know have been her mentor through it. I I didn't do the work. I connected her with the people, uh, but the skill set that I trained her in has turned out to be very useful for them. So I want to get more of those types of uh, connections going on. And in the work that I'm doing, uh, I've, I've secured a grant uh, building on the stuff that I've done in the summer grant in Arthur Binding Davis, Arthur Binding Danis, Davis seed grant that's run through the Institute for Water and Environmental Resilience at Stetson. Uh, through, through funding sources there, we're seeking to find people to write affirmative narratives of, of uh, Black histories in Blucher County. So memorializing violence is important. But I think it's also important to memorialize, you know, the constructive aspects uh, that have happened because those stories are very should be very common, right? And uh, racial violence is terrible, and hopefully we can come up with more stories of, you know, well, here's how this mill was built, here's how this road was built, here's how these schools, you know, uh, worked in this community, right? So I think there are a lot of stories of interest uh, that don't necessarily involve trauma as the as the front line that we can we can bring to the floor as well. I appreciate you saying that because there um there are more than a few victories as we would say. Yeah. There are more than a few victories, but um there's st those stories haven't been told. Uh so I thank you for wanting to to do that. That's really cool. And you know um it seems like remember well i'll go back i remember several years back at the gillespie museum when you uh had just finished your initial work with the bertram trail yeah and you gave a a, a calf um a science cafe or you gave a talk one evening yeah those, that was, you organized those yeah i thought that was really cool and yeah it it's amazing that that okay so the the work was so rich right that you can now extend it and in, and make these other impacts based on this work you know uh just as you've been mentioning it's a trail but now you can dial in stories about other aspects of that period of time and the culture our society and the bike trail you just mentioned including stories you know so it, it so the trails become um an educational loop as well, right? People are yeah, just and hopefully cycling. the places where people meet. Yeah. Right. I feel like if you meet on a hiking trail or a bike trail, it's it's hard to feel like. I mean, everybody's out there to you know relax and recreate. It's hard to have bad vibes when when something when you're doing something like that. So. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, no, that's really cool. That's really yeah. cool. It's really cool. It's a nice, uh, if I may, it's it's a nice, you know, icing on the cake. You know, it's 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 a nice way to top it off because you've given so much effort and put so much energy into into this intellectual endeavor to bring it to life. I think that's a wonderful thing. So, in closing, um, I would just like to ask you one other question, and then uh, thank you for a great conversation today. See. Uh, looking ahead, what plans do you have to continue this work, or, or you, is it going to obviously it'll morph? I'm assuming it's going to morph into something else, maybe. Yeah, well, uh, I think mainly I want to get this Bartram stuff sort of nailed down and passed off to the National Park Service. Uh, that's that's the goal of the Bartram Trail Conference. So they want me to provide something that is compelling to the National Park Service so that they can get that going, and then. Uh, I can hopefully fade into the background there and, and, and let it take on its life and just stick my head up if I think things are moving in a direction that I'd rather not see. Um, I definitely want to see more students uh, 
getting into creating uh, these story maps, so to speak, of, uh, you know, uh, experiences that are just sitting here in the archives and in, in people's, uh, you know, memory that, you know, can, can make them available uh, to a wider audience. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to be turning towards GIS a bit more than I, than I have in the past and, you know, bringing this into my, my tool set a little more intentionally and doing it with, you know, public history in mind. So uh, in a more humanities kind of artistic format. So uh, moving a bit away from my uh, reductionist science background and, and more into this uh, uh, you know, artistic uh, and, and discourse driven side. It's because you've become wise. <laughs> Thank sage, you. you know? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, uh, premiere podcast. Uh, from the fact, you know, I, I should remind you, I think I was the first faculty spotlight speaker in 2012 when this series started uh, uh, quite a ways back. Uh, uh, I'm sure faculty spoke before, but I think the faculty spotlight series moniker goes back to that time. So uh, I'm, I feel very lucky and, you know, fortuitous to be like, Circling around to yeah, another first right, about right. almost 10 years later. Thank you, Tony. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay. So, but thank you very much.